All right, here we go. So um, what started as ensuring compliance with local health directives and administering the new COVID leave provisions has morphed into a full-blown COVID response that touches literally all areas of our district. Um, I cannot take credit for this at all. When I see that quote there, we are all in this together, um, that is so true in that our district team is all in this together and has offered input into this website. And then our community as well has been absolutely phenomenal in um, supporting, uh, providing information to us as we navigate what responding to COVID-19 looks like. So as we started um, just before school started and we were attempting to mesh all of the different pieces of COVID response together, Trent Jones had the brilliant idea of saying, let's create a website that's linked to our homepage that just has everything COVID there. So if you haven't spent any time on this website, I would encourage you to do that. You can go to it at go.sdale.org slash COVID. Uh, there's a link on the district's homepage that will take you there, and this is where you will find everything COVID-related. On the left-hand side there, you'll see that um, you can click the button for Spanish, and it automatically translates the website to Spanish. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that same luxury with Marshallese, but we included some Marshallese videos that explain different portions of the website. So um, our Marshallese speakers can access the website as well, and um, those videos explain some different aspects. The first piece on the website are two sets of, well, went a little too far there, two sets of Google Forms. And I'm going to talk about what happens on the front end and the back of these forms. The one um, that says, have you tested positive for COVID-19? We ask that any staff or student who receives positive COVID-19 test results fill out this form. When they fill out the form, it has information about when they were last on campus, do they have symptoms, where they were tested, even what kind of test they took. Um, that matters some to the medical community, um, reliability. So all that information is there. When a family or a staff member fills that out, it automatically populates to a spreadsheet that alerts myself, Damon Donnell, Kathy Launder, and Monica Witchen that there is a positive case reported and the response starts immediately. What that looks like most times is that Monica Witchen, who is our assistant nursing director, she works um, closely alongside Kathy Launder, um, either Monica or Kathy calls that family immediately, confirms the information that's in the spreadsheet that they reported, when they were last on campus is key, when their test results were received, when symptoms started. They can then um, notify the family return to school dates. Um, they have lists of things to do to isolate the, the person who is positive from other family members, if that's possible. Um, talk to them about when they need to seek additional medical care if their symptoms um, develop or get worse. And so they go through a whole process with them to get all the information that we need to start our process of contact tracing, basically. Um, and to make sure that they're safe and know what to do next as far as their health is concerned. So let's say that um, they get notified that a student is positive. That next step is to call the principal immediately. This is really, it's not 24 seven, but it's pretty close to it. So on Sunday afternoon or on Labor Day yesterday, when we start getting reports of positive cases, this process has to start immediately because we want to make sure that we've identified the people who don't need to come to school the next day. Um, so the call goes out to the principal that says, hey, we've gotten a report that this student, we'll use the example of student, it's the same process with a staff member, that this person is positive. We need to know everyone who was within six feet for 15 or more minutes of this person in this time period. The time period that they're looking at is typically 48 hours before symptoms start. So um, sometimes that's helpful, in particular over the Labor Day holiday, because we had a few that um, the 48 hour window 
wasn't an on-campus period. It was over the, the weekend. But, you know, most days kids are on campus, so we start the process of identifying those students. Now you may say, how in the world do you know who was within six feet for 15 or more minutes? I know that it's not an exact science, but our buildings are doing a phenomenal job of keeping seating charts to where they're able to go and measure where a particular student sits and knows that any person at these tables or these desks would have been within six feet for 15 or more minutes to the best of our knowledge. Now, um, once we have the, those people that we've identified as within six feet for 15 or more minutes are called probable close contacts. So as the school district, we only have the ability to identif in, identify probable close contacts. We don't officially label them close contacts. That's the role of the health department. Now part of this process that um, is not working how we thought it would work, um, Initially, when the school districts were trained on this process, we were told that the health department would come in behind us and call all of those probable close contacts, have conversations with them, and then confirm them as close contacts. So the health department could ask more questions to determine whether those people need to actually quarantine. As best we can tell, that piece of the process is not happening. So I can give you a personal story. Um, my son, the Friday of the first week of school, I see him appear on the probable close contact list. So he was quarantined. He went back to school today. Um, but we didn't get a phone call during that whole time period from the health department. Um, nobody contacted us except for the school district. And I wonder, I obviously know what that means and that we are to keep him home away from other people quarantined, but I wonder if other people may just think, oh, my child can't go to school, and they don't understand that if they are a close contact, they don't need to be out in the community as well. So that's really a piece that Dr. Cleveland and I have, have, have had conversations about, about how do, we, how do we fix that piece of the process? If the health department can't do it, can the school district have some additional authority to um, further investigate whether um, the people meet probable close contacts. And a another thing to consider is that, um, so my son's in elementary school, he probably wouldn't be able to articulate how close he was to the person that was positive. But what if you have a high school student who is able to, although on a seating chart looks like they would meet that criteria of within six feet for 15 or more minutes, what if that high school student is able to say with 100% confidence, I was not within six feet for 15 or more minutes to the point that that would allow them to go back to school. We just don't have that authority yet. Um, I'm hoping that something changes in the process that will fix that for us, but um, that is one, one piece that is an issue that, that's not really something we have the authority to address at this time. So the, the six foot though, so let's say Michelle and I are sitting here is positive. Is it six foot unprotected or six foot protected? With or without a mask. Okay. So the wearing of the mask doesn't stop quarantine, but what we hope it does is stop the, the spread of COVID. So even though you, if Michelle turns up positive, you would be required to quarantine, we would hope that you wearing face masks would prevent the spread. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about numbers in, in just a second and we'll, we might, we don't have but great I, numbers to be able to hit on that but yet. If I'm but I'm six foot one inch away from her, then I fall out of the probable category. Yes, or if you were within six feet for 13 minutes, you fall out of that probable category. And that standard, it's not something that we made up, or even from best I can tell, the health department made up. It appears to be a national standard um, that I, I don't really know where it came from, but that is the standard that's being used yeah. nationwide to identify those people that need to quarantine. I have a quick question for you. Um, so then, do probable contacts, do they have to quarantine for the full two weeks or do they just quarantine until they get a test, a negative test result? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So the probable close contacts have to quarantine 14 days from the last exposure. Um, positive or negative test results do not influence that. Um, actually, this is kind of a, a piece that is mind-blowing. 
Um, a positive test could actually mean that you could come back sooner because you enter a different criteria if you come back positive, but a negative test result does not change your length of quarantine. So um, one other piece is, or a couple other pieces, um, once we've identified those probable close contacts and those phone calls are made, um, principals have access to um, anybody from their building that is a positive or a probable close contact. They're likely going to know this because they're involved in the process, but they're able to quickly look at their sheet, see the name, and if they see Michelle walking up and know that she's still on, on quarantine, they're able to see her name when she's supposed to be back and then hopefully stop her at the door and call parents to come pick a student up if they're coming back too soon. After um, we have identified a positive, um, at this time all schools are sending out a letter. Some are also doing this by robocall, um, recorded call that they may read the letter, that notifies their staff and all of the families in their building that there's been a positive case in the school. We're not able to go into a lot of detail. We're not able to say who the kid was, um, but we do hope that the transparency will make parents feel more confident in the process and more confident in the steps that are being taken. Um, I don't know. We'll see. You know, we're, we're just over two weeks into the school year, and so we'll get some feedback on whether that's too much, not enough, and we can monitor and adjust as we go. That is the theme of this whole process, is seeing what works and doesn't work and fixing the process as we go. So another form that you see a link to there is, has a member of your home tested positive for COVID-19? This actually gets a lot of response. Our community is doing a fantastic job of saying, hey, here's what's going on in my house and my child may not be to school for this period of time, or here's what's going on in my house, does my child need to stay home from school? So uh, the same process is when a family fills out that form, it goes through to um, Kathy Launder and Monica Witchin, and they're able to make personal phone calls to these families and get additional information and either say, yes, you're correct in keeping your child home, we'll make sure they're listed here with their return date, make sure that you're accessing their learning remotely, um, and principals also have access to this. At the same time, they're able to sometimes say, no, your child hasn't met the criteria of being a close contact if, for example, someone may report um, that an extended family member tested positive, but the child hasn't been in contact with the extended family member. And so they can continue to come to school unless the um, people within their household test positive. So we're also able to have that conversation to hopefully keep the kids that can be in school in school without unnecessarily quarantining them. Okay, so just below the forms that come through, and also um, we have down at the bottom of this webpage, if someone doesn't want to fill out the form, doesn't have access to fill out the form, two things can happen. One, their building um, principals or whoever's in the office can fill out the form on their behalf, and we have authorized that um, because we have a, a check process and that Kathy can call them, make sure all the information is, is correct. Or they can just call the, the nurse office directly, um, and you'll see the number there at the bottom. When you call that number, the very first option is if you have a COVID-related issue, press 1. And when you press 1, you usually get uh, Monica or Kathy unless they're on the phone calling people. So we feel like we've got a, a good process for people to report, and based on the numbers that um, are coming in, particularly on the, the exposure form, we feel like the word has gotten out that people um, are using that form. So um, another piece of this website is the COVID daily numbers and also weekly numbers. So we have some restrictions on reporting numbers and that the Arkansas Department of Health has told us not to uh, report numbers less than five. Uh, for privacy restrictions. So um, when we have cases over five on a particular day, they are reported here. And I'll click um, to show you. So for example, 
This was the report that we posted this morning. These were actually numbers from yesterday. Um, you'll see, well, <laughs> numbers from yesterday, but I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, eight student and staff positive cases with probable close contacts of 91 identified, and then we list the buildings affected. So because we cannot identify less than five, sometimes we have several days that we can't identify, we can't identify, we can't identify. We just add those up until they get over five, and then we'll identify them all on, on a particular day. That's what happened here. So you'll see in the, the language below the buildings, um, on September 4th, 5th, 6th, we didn't have enough cases to report those individually, but when we got to the seventh, we made it over the five mark, so we were able to report all those cases on the seventh. So if you were to see a, so I'll just go to the sixth and show you. If you were to see this that says, basically we've had several days running where we don't have enough cases to report, but we'll report those on the next day that we can. And these go back um, to the beginning of, to August 20, well, the numbers go back to August 24th. I believe our first daily report was on the 26th or the 27th. So, so, go ahead. so before you go any further, the, the 18 that the news is so excited to report, is that a cumulative total? Is that a... So the health department numbers have been a little bit tricky for us to decode. Um, some of the number, depending on where you're looking, Sometimes the numbers, for example, the, the ACHI data, the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, has some, some detailed um, community information. My understanding of how they report some of their Springdale School District information is that it's actually number of cases of people that reside in the boundaries of Springdale School District. So they may have no connection to our school at all. Um, they just live within our boundaries. Now, the Arkansas Department of Health, starting last week, started reporting school district numbers. I don't know exactly um, the time frame, when those cases are from, if they're some from over the summer that are just now getting here. It's hard to decode exactly what data they're looking at as far as um, the cumulative cases in particular. The active cases have been roughly where I think we would be as far as active cases. Um, but again, it's hard for us on, on this side to decode exactly okay. which cases they're looking at. Um, another piece that we um, just really don't have the capacity to do is to uh, decipher the active cases. So active cases, my understanding is a health-related definition that means the person is still um, within a certain time period of positive results or exhibiting symptoms, which is part of what the health department does with their contact tracing. We're just not tracking at that level, and so um, determining who's still active or not is something I just don't think we're equipped to do. So I'm not saying that the health department numbers are incorrect. I just don't know exactly where they're coming from and how they line up with dates as far as our students. Another thing that I will say too, um, if we have a student, say a student is virtual and they report to us that they are positive and they have not been on our campus since March, remember part of what we've asked is last time on campus, we are considering that they do not affect our school district operations because they haven't been on campus, haven't been around any teachers, haven't been around any other students, and we are not reporting those in our daily numbers. So um, some of the health department data may include virtual students who haven't been on our, our campus, so don't really affect our operations. The second piece, and we just started doing this on Friday, we'll update it every Friday. Um, this was actually a two-week report because we just started doing it is breaking down cases for the week by staff and student positives. Um, let's see if I can scroll. You'll see most do not have any uh, identifying numbers because again, we cannot report cases that are less than five. The only exception is um, DTSOI has had five staff members that have been positive, so their five is up there. The totals are accurate in that 13 staff 
and 12 students have um, been reported positive and actually um, the number today would be 17 staff members and 19 students have been reported positive. Um, based on those reports, there have been a total of 276 students and staff members that have been quarantined as probable close contacts. Um, some of those are already coming back. So, you know, we're a little over two weeks into school. And so some of those based on exposure time, et cetera, are starting to come back. So that is not the number that is out today. That's the total that has been asked to quarantine for any period of time. Now, something that I think is really interesting that I would love for someone who has a lot more experience with data to really dig down into and study for us as we proceed through this is whether we're seeing spread within our school or whether it's exposure from the outside that the kids and staff just happen to come at school. I don't think we have any statistically significant numbers right now to be able to do that. But I will say that when we've quarantined um, 276, but our positive numbers are only totaling 36, to me that's promising that the, the spread is not happening within the school, that it's somewhere else. Um, to me, this says that our teachers are doing a fantastic job of spacing and enforcing wearing masks. Um, or they're the theory that it's not as transmittable as we once thought. I don't know. I, I really am interested in what um, the data plays out as far as um, student to student transmission, student to staff, and staff to staff transmission. I will say I don't have good. I don't have enough numbers at all to comment on too. But I will say today we have zero evidence of any student to student transmission at school. There, there is a lot of data. It's just not getting publicized about student to student transfer, especially in the younger kids and student to staff. Oh. You just have to get find it. No, and I, I'm not, when I say it doesn't get the clicks that the bad news gets. So, it, but it's out there. Right. No, I'm. I'm. And I've seen some of it. I'm really interested in our data and what it looks like here's for our kids. Here's what I think is really encouraging for our staff, and, and we probably have a little more time to get past. But our staff has been together since the 11th of August. Mm -hmm. Not correct in that. So, so there's some really good um, four, four or five weeks now that that they've all been together, and, and we're, I think they're doing a fantastic job. I mean, we're Biggest employer, one of the biggest employers in the state, and definitely a peer. I think it's yeah, and I think it's important. Good, good information, good numbers. And one of the things I wish um, it, we should probably publish, and when the health department publishes information, something I wish they would put out is um, the number of people we're dealing with. So when you're dealing with 21,000 plus students and 3,000 plus staff members, to have numbers like this. I think is, is pretty impressive and I'm going to knock on some wood and hope that we stay um, in this relatively low range. So again, we're updating the numbers daily. Right now we're doing it seven days a week. I don't know if we'll continue that or not, but it's working for now. Um, the weekly numbers are updated on, will be updated on Friday morning, every Friday morning. Uh, Dr. Smith is going to come in just a, a second to talk about the essential worker program and then um, I'm going to wait till the bottom to talk about COVID leave for staff because there's some more information down there but again just trying to put everything COVID related here so that it's easy to find no matter who you are parent community member staff member you can find it all right here so again we link um, we tell people to please self-report. We included the phone number and then get another link to the form there to hope that they'll, they'll do that. Um, we've also included the process for notification. Parents are gonna be notified, which we talked about. Um, the affected families, of course, are getting phone calls because their students are being asked, asked, asked <laughs> excuse me, to quarantine. And then, um, Theoretically, the health department comes behind and gives further guidance. I think they are doing that for positive cases, maybe a few days out, um, but so far we're not seeing that on the probable close contacts. 
before school started, um, Dr. Cleveland did this Q&A with Dr. Gary Wheeler, so we've included that there as well that has some really good information about various aspects of, of COVID response. Um, additional resources, anything that you could possibly want to know, transportation, food service, how the attendance policy has changed, learning models, all the things that you've kind of seen as we led up to the opening of school. And then finally, um, the link to COVID-19 leave for employees. So one of the things that happened um, when this pandemic began is the federal government passed um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which offered um, 10 days of leave for COVID-related illness and up to 12 weeks of leave if you didn't have childcare because school or daycare closure. So um, back in the summer, to try to help our employees understand exactly what this leave could be used for, we put out a screen Castify. It's about 20 minutes long, but it's linked there if you want to watch it, that talks about the reasons for the COVID leave, how much you get paid, because it varies depending on the reason that you take the leave for. You could either get full pay or sometimes you get two-thirds pay. So we did our best to explain that where they could understand. Um, and then also included the link to the form, another form, um, but it's really been very helpful in, in processing these that an employee would fill out a COVID leave form if they need to request leave for this. Um, this process is um, through me and then to the business office. So the business office knows how and when um, their paycheck should not be affected is usually the case. They wanna make sure they're not docking them for not being there on days that are COVID related. Um, so we're working through making sure we have all the right information on um, COVID leave versus how absences are put into our system. Being asked to COVID. Yes, um, so just when the federal COVID leave came out, it was pretty wide open in that you didn't have to have any documentation. You were just supposed to do it. Uh, public employers were not getting any reimbursement for it um, that was available through payroll tax credit for private employers. And so it was, it was pretty wide open. Just before school started, the governor announced um, state COVID leave is what I call it, um, specific to state, um, to teachers and school employees in Arkansas that offers them an additional 10 days of leave for COVID related reasons. Now for those 10 days, we can get reimbursed, but we have to have documentation. And so, um, and it would be very simple if the reasons for the leave lined up perfectly, but they really don't. Um, so there's kind of some different reasons for COVID leave through the state versus federal. Um, and we do our best to track and make sure that we have documentation for as many of the state leave um, periods as we can so that we can get reimbursed for those. So an employee, if they meet the criteria, and you see them listed there are the state criteria for leave. If they've tested positive, if they're symptomatic and seeking a medical diagnosis, or if they're a probable close contact or close contact, then that qualifies them for the state COVID leave. Um, we ask them for documentation. Most of the time they have something and we're able to um, code those as state COVID leave. If they used all of that and still needed additional time, they would go into the federal COVID leave, which is a little bit more expansive on the reasons. If they went through all 20 days and were still having issues, we would start looking at whether um, they need to be FMLA qualified. Um, they would start going into their sick days um, and we would, we would work with them through whatever came next. All of these, um, for either kind of COVID leave, we, it's confusing. I mean, I, I spend a majority of my day um, processing through the forms and, and coding them correctly, and it's, it's confusing to me. Um, we try to make it as, as user-friendly as possible for employees, so when they go in to fill out the form, they're not picking, oh, I want state COVID leave or I want federal COVID leave. We just ask them to say the reason that they need the leave, and then we process through which one it qualifies for. That is all the information on the website. I do want to say, um, you probably heard me say, fill out this form, fill out this Google form several times. 
Um, I can take absolutely zero credit for those forms. Damon Donnell is the Google form master. Um, and I will call him and say, hey, you think we can make a Google form for this? And I just have this broad concept and he literally makes it in like 10 minutes. And it's like, come look at this. It does amazing things. It has saved so many hours um, and made the process. I know it seems probably convoluted, but it really is going pretty seamless across all of the different people that have to look at this information. So thank you, Mr. Donnell. And I'm sorry I call you every 10 minutes for a Google form issue. <laughs> okay, so I know we went through a lot and then maybe some things that we didn't go through that you wanna talk about. Um, oh, one thing I do wanna mention on the COVID leave, um, I asked the ladies in the business office to run a report and they told me that today we had 61 employees out on COVID leave. Now there's probably a little flexibility in this number because sometimes people are on the form and they don't get the leave and then sometimes people are not on the form and they need the leave and so that's a rough number but today there are 61 employees coded as being on COVID leave. What questions do you have? I was just going to say, you did a really good job of explaining yeah, it. Thorough. And the well, website's impressive. Only started, but you answered it all. Okay. What we want to do is clip what she did tonight and post it to the website as well. Because there have been many questions that we filter all, all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when we came up with the idea of COVID with the school board, what do we do? We knew that you all get a majority of the questions when you're out in the public too. So what could we answer here tonight? And then what generated questions would you have that would additionally benefit any others in the community or in your school district as far as staff? So that's, that's our effort and that's what we plan to do if it's okay with you all. I think the simple answer for us, if someone asks us, is just go to the school website and look at the information because I'm not gonna try to remember yeah. what she said. I mean, that was, what? That was amazing. What? <laughs> 